The Lord be with you. And also with you. Uh, if I could encourage members of governing body, please, to take their places for the next session. Well, dear friends, it gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce Bishop Anthony Pogo to you formally. Um, he's already become a friend. We've already heard him preach, and so we so know something of him and of his style. But before I invite him to take the platform, I'd like to tell you a little bit about him, because Anthony is someone who has lived a remarkable life and indeed is a living example of the persecuted Christian of which Jim spoke so powerfully earlier on. Uh, Bishop Pogo was born in 1964. It means I can give him four years um, on a seniority. But uh, he was born as the son of an Anglican priest uh, who... Uh, and was born in Sudan, as it was then, um, and at a time of huge unrest within that country. And indeed, uh, Anthony became a refugee at one year of age when his family had to flee during the first Sudanese civil war uh, to safety in Uganda and wasn't able to return to his home country until 1973, when he was nine years old. However, God marked him out for ministry from an early age. He was educated at the University of Juba in Sudan and also at Oxford Brookes University in England. He worked, first of all, for Scripture Union, and then in 1995 was ordained as a deacon and the following year as a priest in the normal Anglican way. He worked with ACROSS, which is a mission agency that worked in Sudan and rose through the ranks eventually to become its executive director. In 2007, Anthony was elected as Bishop of Kajo Keiji, a diocese now in South Sudan, uh, a country which is still war, uh, 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 subject to uh, war and division and persecution, and in which the Christian Church uh, exercises a very powerful ministry of witness to Jesus Christ and the Prince of Peace. He held that position as a Darson bishop until 2016, when he was invited by the current Archbishop of Canterbury to become his advisor on Anglican communion affairs. And Anthony worked in uh, Lambeth Palace, and I began to get to know him uh, as a friend in that time. In 2022, Anthony succeeded Archbishop Josiah as Secretary General of the Anglican Communion. Uh, that is one of the most remarkable posts in the Anglican Communion. And the Anglican Communion office is one of those bizarre places where you can find yourself in Buenos Aires one week and in Hong Kong the next. Indeed, I remember one occasion when I had to hurriedly reorganise a meeting and phone members of commission uh, and tell them that we're still meeting next week, 
but we're now in Hong Kong rather than New York, um, which was a remarkable set of conversations. Today, we're extremely pleased that Bishop Anthony is with us here in uh, Wales, on Llambed, and uh, it's a great pleasure to invite him to come and speak to you now. Bishop Anthony, a warm welcome from us. Thank you so much, uh, Bishop Gregory. Um, I'm looking at the clock there and uh, the timer there, and uh, I hope it's not only five minutes. Um, <laughs> Uh, it reminds me of the saying that uh, you in the West, you have watches. We in the global south, we have the time. So, <laughs> but I'll try to keep it to the half an hour or so. Um, I want to thank Archbishop uh, Andy for the invitation to address you all uh, this morning. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm glad to be here. And it's been wonderful having the fellowship with uh, with many of you, getting to know you, getting to know your context, getting to know the work that you do in, in your different uh, parishes and dioceses. I want to start by saying that the Church in Wales is a valued member of the Anglican Communion. And as you know, we are, we are a communion, a family of provinces. We are a family of provinces. We are where, in fact, so earlier during a tea break, someone reminded us of this saying that we don't have an Anglican church per se. We actually have churches of the Anglican communion. The 42 provinces are all autonomous, and we have the communion, which is a family. So I want to thank you indeed for the opportunity to be here. And thank you for many of you who are serving in different roles, capacities, you know, in the communion, and a number of you here how uh, continue to play important roles. It was so wonderful to have Archbishop Andy at the primates meeting uh, in Rome recently, uh, and also many of you here. Um, Bishop Mary, um, as a member of the uh, Consul Anglican Consultative Council, your contributions have also been valu valuable. Um, and also many of you here, Dr. Payne, uh, Bishop Gregory, who has also been a member of the Anglican Oriental Orthodox International Commission, uh, the, ven ven uh, the very Reverend Sarah Roland uh, and her ecumenical commission connections and also a member of EASCUFO. Many of you also are members of various networks and commissions of the communion. I don't have time to go through all the, 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 uh, the list, but I want to thank you for work, the work that you do. I also want to commend you as a, as a province on the work you do on safeguarding the environment, gender justice, and you know many other things that you do here. Uh, your commitment to gender equality is highlighted as you are the first province in the communion to have more female bishops than male bishops at one time. And thank you for that, all that you do. Um, Bishop, Bishop Andy, it was good to have you and your colleagues visit us in November, at the Ang November 2022. Uh, which was actually when I was two months in my, in my, my role. It was good to, to, to welcome you. And also to lend my support to your food and fuel campaign. Um, thank you for all that you do. I want to begin by saying a few things about the role of the Anglican Communion Office. As, as Bishop Gregory rightly pointed out, it's indeed it's a bizarre place. Uh, many, many things happen there. Uh, we remind ourselves and we say we are not the headquarters of the Anglican Communion. We are a secretariat that serves the Communion. And some people have asked me while I've been here to say, are you based at Lambeth Palace? We are not. We are, we are at the Anglican Communion office and we are, we, are, we are not part of Lambeth Palace. We do serve the Archbishop of Canterbury as one of the instruments, but we are not, not part of Lambeth Palace. We work at the Anglican Communion Office. Normally, we refer to it as the ACO, and the official secretary of the communion, serving the 42 provinces in over 165 countries. We see ourselves as, enabling, as an enabling team to serve and strengthen communion life. Our role is about connecting the Anglican churches around the globe in their mission and in fellowship. 
And we do this in several ways, uh, through visits that I make to provinces, listening to the instruments of communion, supporting global conversations, building ecumenical and interfaith relations, advocating for justice, peace, and equality, uh, and resourcing Anglicans in mission. I'll give a few examples of some of the things that I've just outlined. In terms of visits to provinces, a key part of my role as Secretary General is visiting member churches of the communion. And uh, this is my first visit uh, in, my, in my role as Secretary General, and it's been wonderful, as I've already said, to be here. During vis visits like this, I try to listen, I try to get to know uh, the province, but I also try to share what I have learned from other provinces. Um, um, yesterday I mentioned uh, the number of provinces I visited. I have now confirmed that actually I have visited 21 provinces in my role as Secretary General. Um, initially my plan was to visit all the provinces within the first three years. Now, that was an ambitious um, uh, target. I wouldn't be able to do that. As you can see, out of 42, I've only done 21. I have another three or three or four before the end of the year. And uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's been encouraging visiting many of these provinces. Some of the trips I visit, I undertake, are solidarity visits, um, particularly, as we heard today, there are situations where there are huge challenges. Um, just a few of the places I visited in the last few years, in the last few months, have been solidarity visits because of the situation that they are in. One of them, Sudan, because of what they are going through. Some of you may be aware that the primate, the Archbishop of Sudan, has been forced out of his uh, uh, cathedral, out of his diocese in Khartoum. He is now in Port Sudan. So I visited him early this, uh, this year as a way of you know, encouraging him uh, where, where he is now. I also visit Myanmar, uh, it's another place which uh, needs our prayers, and uh, Jerusalem, to name a few. Um, last year, I was part of the Ecumenical Peace pilgrimages, a pilgrimage to South Sudan, led by His Holiness the Pope, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the moderator of the Church of Scotland. And so some of these are things that I do in my role. These visits are a strong reminder that we are, we are one family. We are a family of uh, the Anglican Communion, and, 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 and it's helpful to be able to visit, to be able to learn, to be able to share, as I have um, visited many, many of these provinces. Listening to the Communion, the, AC, the ACO enables the cooperative work of the, the Anglican member churches by supporting the four instruments of the Anglican Communion. Just a quick reminder, the four instruments are the Anglican Constitutive Council, the Primates Meeting, the Lambeth Conference, and the Archbishop of Canterbury. We facilitate some of the meetings, the meetings of these instruments. We provide the needed support to these, 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 these meetings. We also share resolutions uh, with provinces, and we support the various commissions and network, networks to advance you know, this continuous working together. Uh, we recently worked with the Anglican Center in Rome to deliver the 2024 Primates Meeting. Uh, we are now currently planning the next Anglican Consultative Council in 2026 in, in, in Ireland. So as, as, as the ACO, as a church, as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a communion, we are called to be missional in what we do, working through the five marks of mission, defining our purpose as, as Anglicans. Um, and I'm sure you are familiar with the five marks of missions. It's important that we continue to do that in our different contexts and in our dioceses. In terms of championing global conversations, through the work that we do in supporting the instruments, we identify Anglican priorities in, 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 in this particular uh, you know, uh, group of churches, and also in, in, our, in, in our global, in, in, our, in the world affairs. We try to also raise the profile of, for these things by working with the commissions and networks and amplifying global conversations. 
we are currently running a series for bishops on science and faith, and I'm, I was glad that we, this came up yesterday, uh, what you are doing in your province. This week, the church, Safe Church Commission, they're meeting in Zimbabwe to run a capacity building event hosted by uh, the Diocese of Matabili in Bulawayo uh, in the province of uh, Central Africa. And I, I was glad to hear that you have a representative in that meeting. We also advocate for peace, justice, and equality. The Anglican Communion has an official consultative status at the United Nations where we have representatives, a representative where we voice, we voice the, at least the views of the, the Anglican Communion on major global issues. Our UN team enables better relationships and more effective communication between the provinces and dioceses of the Communion so that our voice is also heard at, at the United Nations. You have been focusing on the persecuted church. We have also tried to do that through our team at the United Nations, but also we have tried as much as possible as the Anglican Communion Office to highlight you know, some of these issues when they, they, they come up. Uh, in June, for instance, with the attack in Pakistan of Christians, it was horrific, and we lament on things like this when they happen. And we try as much as we can to encourage and, and support the, the churches when they go through things like this, but also try to highlight these issues so that we can pray as a family. We see ourselves at the Anglican Community Office playing a role also in encouraging unity and interfaith relations. The, our Unity Faith and Order team organize and oversee our Anglican ecclesiastical engagement at a global level between Anglican churches, but also with other Christian denominations. The, the UFO team provide advice on theology, doctrine, and liturgy to, and liturgy to help Christians grow in faith and unity. This January, we worked with the Vatican to deliver an ecumenical summit on Anglican and Catholic bishops during the, the week of prayer for Christian unity. This was a special week, which saw the Pope uh, and the Archbishop of Canterbury commission these bishops uh, in pairs to go out for joint mission. Again, and a good example of our ecumenical relationship. We also uh, focus, the work of the ACO focus also on sharing resources to help in, in Anglican missions and outreach. We are, you all may also be aware of the Lambeth Conference, uh, the, the, the number of calls that came out of the Lambeth Conference. Since, the Lambeth, since the, the Lambeth Conference, which took place in 2022, our Episcopal Ministry team have delivered a number of webinar, webinars and, and on, on, this, on, the, on each of the calls. So far, we have uh, produced free Bible studies and resources so that churches can ex explore the calls that came out of the Lambeth Conference in their own settings. This, the, the themes that we have covered so far have included safe church, the environment, mission, discipleship, science, and faith. The next webinar will be on, on, on human dignity and is taking place on 6th and 7th November. I want to share a few, a few, a few mission stories of hope. Um, our Anglican Communion consists of many fellowships, provinces I've already uh, referred to. We are one family and we focus on relationship which hold us together. We have different models uh, that exist and can be, that, that, that exist across, across the globe. And I want to fair, just refer to an example of church growth, which I believe is an important theme to, to focus on this morning. And one of my favorite stories is a story from Kenya. The church in Kenya has experienced tremendous growth over the, the, the last few years, and especially in the last 30 plus years that I have uh, come to know, and, and I, come, I lived in Kenya uh, from the 90s. In fact, I studied at the Nairobi International School of Theology from 1992 to 1994. And one particular example I remember was, at that time, the, the church in Kenya, uh, the Anglican ch church in Kenya was, was dwindling in numbers. 
many of the young people who are leaving the church to join uh, newer churches, the Pentecostal church, and, and, and the numbers are going down. And I remember in 92, trying to board a bus, one of the conductors was telling us, come in, come in, my, my bus is as empty as an Anglican church. And this was because the charismatic churches were growing and the Anglican church was going down. Now, this was 30 years ago. It has changed. It's grown now. In fact, the Old Saints Cathedral in Nairobi has 15 services every Sunday. And with huge numbers that come in, a variety, ranging from you know, a, 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 a charismatic type of church a church using the Book of Common Prayer and one which is kind of in between young people, children, all sorts of services that happen. They had to be innovative. They had to make sure that they met the needs of the people. They had to scratch where it is itching. Otherwise, doing it one way wasn't helpful. And as a result, young people are leaving. Now, the young, the many of these young people have come back. I think I want to encourage us to be thinking of an innovative way of doing church rather than doing it because this is always how we have done it. Plant Anglican, the Anglican Communion Church Planting Network are meeting in October in Malaysia to continue in their mission to reach new people with the gospel and resource and encourage effective church planting. We need to be thinking of church planting. We need to be thinking of different models. In the UK, I am familiar with the HTV model, which has helped to grow and revive churches with small congregations or churches that have been dormant. It has helped this, this reduce the decline of churches in many parts, many parts of, 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 of this country. And I want to commend bishops in dioceses in the UK and maybe in your own province who have welcomed church plans or a different way of doing church. It's important that we do that. We are there as the ACO to help, support, encourage, but also share stories. I encourage you to keep visiting the channels of the ACO, the Anglican Community News Service, and also various other channels so that you get to know what, what, what we are able to share. And also we are able to share your own stories. What are our priorities at the Anglican Communion Office? I want to just talk of two or three things. Peace. Every day we hear the Anglican churches around the world impacted by situations of war and conflict. We will continue to advocate on their behalf and raise attention on their plight. Last week we shared a statement from the Episcopal Church of Jerusalem in calling for peace and an immediate ceasefire. My recent visit to Kajukeji, my, my former diocese, was an opportunity to encourage a community that, that are rebuilding themselves after many years of war, the trauma and destruction of war. Unity is another thing. At the S Anglican Communion ACC in 2023, a resolution was passed asking the Inter-Anglican Standing Commission on Unity, Faith and Order to explore theological questions regarding the structures and uh, decision-making the Anglican Communion. A working group was set up comprising of Anglicans from around the world with your own representative in Yaskifo has been working on this to shape these proposals. We believe and that this is one of the ways in which we can continue to hear from each other, but also be ready to, 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 to provide the needed changes that we need to do as we review various things within the community, including the instruments. Yaskifo will take recommendations to the ACC in 2026. Prayer. Ultimately, we remember that as Christians, our role is to promote the unity of God's church, but also to, to, to continue to pray. It was encouraging this morning to hear that many of you in your, in your churches use the Anglican cycle of prayer, which we try as much as possible to share on our social media. We pray for one diocese every day. And on Sunday, on Sundays, we pray for one of the 42 provinces of the communion. The, ne the next time we'll pray for you in the church in Wales is in January, 5th of January. 
provincial contributions. I want to thank you in this province. Thank you, Archbishop Andrew and the, the here, the, the church in Wales, for consistently giving your provincial contributions over the years to this to the, the work of the ACO. To support the instruments and resources and resource the communion well, we cannot do without funds. And the contribution from the provinces are, are, is one of the two main sources of our income that helps us do our work. The other one being the Campus Royal Society. We have seen that the provincial contributions have, have, have gone down. Uh, in some provinces, that is a challenge. We are not able to you know, receive the contributions. But thank you for what you do. We are looking at additional long-term sources of support, in particular an endowment fund to better support the work we do. Despite the many challenges and also the things that I've outlined in the world, I'm also overwhelmed by stories of hope as I travel, as I travel across the communion. I will be leaving a digital copy of a highlight of what we do as the Anglican Communion Office for you to hear some of these stories so that this is shared amongst you. And from what I have shared, we know that there are areas of great conflict and suffering across the globe where the Anglican church, churches are stepping in to be the hands and feet of Christ. We also see that the churches of the Anglican communion across the globe are continuing to meet the physical and spiritual needs of the people. I know that you are doing that in this province. And thank you for what you continue to do faithfully serving the Lord in your context. I want to encourage you, if you haven't already uh, been having any companion links, to consider having companion links with other parts of the communion so that you can share, you can learn from each other and pray for each other. Let us continue to work together in the mission of Christ because there is so much that unites us than that divides us within our beloved Anglican communion family. Thank you so much. Archbishop Andy, can I ask you to come over, Archbishop Andy? I want to give you a copy of my book. And uh, I'll also, so that you can uh, read that. So I'm giving you a gift here, which is kind of to mark our visit here. Uh, it's a glass, um, which has... Uh, Could you stand up here? Oh, I'm sorry. So people can see. Yes, yes. thank you. Would you like to go to the microphone as well? So. Sorry. Because I want to show something. Two things I want to say about this gift. The first is that it's a glass, and uh, Bishop Andy, you have a huge role in uh, taking care of this province uh, with the support of your bishops. And you've maintained unity, continue to maintain unity, but also a reminder that the Church of God is like this glass, it's fragile. It therefore needs to be continued to handle with care and prayer. And also in this, we have a symbol of the Anglican Communion the Campus Rose, which again is a reminder of the need for us to share the good news across the globe. So I want to give you this as a reminder of our visit. Bishop Anthony, that's a delight to receive it. Thank you so much for your visit to us. We will not be outdone. <laughs> in turn, we have some gifts to you to mark your visit to us. And in presenting these uh, gifts from the, the Church in Wales to you, my, my personal thanks for the exceptional way in which you include all of the parts of the Anglican Communion in keeping us together. These are challenging and difficult times for us in our world and in our church. And as I said yesterday, it is so much better when we are able to do more together, better together. And your own work in facilitating that um, cannot be overstated in terms of its importance. Have uh, you become very dear to us? Thank you so much for coming to us, and now please receive these as a gift 
as, of our love and our support for you. Thank you. Uh, it is lovely to celebrate our friendship and to have such an exchange of gifts. But we're not quite ready, Bishop Anthony, to let you off the hook. Um, and that's because Bishop Anthony has kindly agreed to take questions from any member of governing body. Uh, and I invite questions now. If you wish to ask a question, please come forward. Perhaps you'd come to this lectern and then Bishop Anthony can answer from his lectern. Uh, Matt would like to ask a question. He's not actually a member of governing body, which means that uh, we need to give our consent to him asking the question before we even know what the question is. <laughs> uh, would members of governing body please show, if you're willing, for Matt to ask a question? Thank you very much. Matt. Thank you very much. Uh, really enjoyed uh, listening to you. Can um, you give your name? Oh, my so name is Matthew Batten, uh, Diocese of Bangor. Uh, my question is uh, around uh, Anglican communion and, and unity, and in particular thinking about uh, social media and the digital culture. Um, and while it allows us to connect together as a communion, I wonder what your thoughts are on social media as a challenge to Anglican communion? and how we could use it as a place to grow the church. Fine, we can take... Uh, yeah. Is there George, anyone else who'd like to ask a question? Yes, thank you. If you'd like to come forward. Um, name Grace Okutawa from the Diocese of Landaf. And thank you so much for um, bringing your experience and the way that um, you bring that to the Anglican communion. I guess my question is, you spoke about innovation and the importance of innovation, but I wondered practically, um, how do you see the marrying of the new as in innovation, but also the old, the ancient ways of doing things? How do you see those things coming together and any advice for that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark Thomas, um, uh, elected uh, Swansea and Brecon Diocese. Uh, Bishop Anthony, thank you so, so much for such an inspiring presentation. Um, I just, just wondered if, a, a bit like we heard from the, the World Watch List um, earlier from, from Open Doors, when it comes to Anglican provinces, could you give us an idea of what, what are the, the, the poorest provinces and sp just specific um, challenges that they face that we can be praying for? Thank you. You're happy to take a couple yeah, more yeah, questions? Yeah, one, yeah, one more, maybe. Dean Sarah? This is slightly a question to the body here, because um, in 1999, three weeks after I was ordained a deacon in St. Asaph Diocese, I received a fax, do you remember those, inviting me to sit on an international Anglican commission, and I've been involved in the international life of the Anglican communion ever since, and it has enriched my life and ministry in ways that are more profound than I can put into words, the extent of the encouragement of coming across people with a with a faith that is expressed in ways very similar to ours, uh, but being the Anglican sense, and yet different contexts. And there's two things I want to... I want to say that it has shown me that to have confidence as the church in Wales, because often we live under the shadow of the Church of England, which is so much bigger and so much more well-resourced than we have capacity, and to realise that actually... The Church of England is the outlier, and the rest of the Anglican Communion, we are so much alike in the way our provinces and our dynamics and the challenges we face and how we can be encouraged by those experiences. And so I wanted to say, I wanted to ask members of the governing body, if you've been to an Anglican meeting of any sort, can you raise your hand? Because I'm not sure if people, because we don't have a feedback like that, how many people actually have benefited from worldwide global Anglican contacts of one sense or another? You see, it's actually quite a, quite a significant number of us, and we should find ways 
of sharing that feedback and that encouragement that we receive individually amongst us as a, as a church as a whole to find, yes, we're all in it together and we're all bearing one another up. So thank you very much, Bishop Anthony, for all you do. And I look forward to seeing you somewhere around the world <laughs> later this year, probably. Indeed. Thank you very much, Dean Sarah. For a minute, I thought well, you were going to be putting us all on the spot in a major way. Um, Stephen. Stephen Brett, uh, Diocese of St. David. I was very fortunate uh, some 27 years ago now to be uh, here, actually, for um, a young person's uh, Lambeth conference. It was um, running parallel with the, with, the, with the Lambeth conference, and it was something which was really, um, really important to me and something which has shaped uh, my relationship and my understanding of the Anglican Communion, something which I didn't really have an understanding of prior to that. And I'm just wondering, because I, and maybe because of my age and I haven't seen it since, but I haven't seen that engagement at that level with young people in terms of Lambeth Conference mm -hmm. since that point. I'm just wondering if that still happens, uh, and if not, is that something which you may consider bringing back? I met people from all over the Anglican Communion, and it was hugely influential on me, and I hope um, that people were able to take away from, from that as well. So that was my question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll try to uh, cover all the five questions. I think on social media, my, my response is, yes, we need to use social media for, for good rather than for anything negative. But also we need to remember this, that not all parts of the communion are able to use in a social, social media the way we actually do it here. When I was a Dasan bishop in South Sudan, give you, just to give you an example, I, we didn't have telephones when I started. And when I needed to ask my clergy to come for meetings, I'll put a message on a local FM radio station, make an announcement and say, the bishop is asking you to come over for a meeting. <laughs> there was no way I could send emails because they were not existent. It's possible that when I started, I may have been the only one who knew how to use emails. And my own Dustin secretary didn't have any computer when I first started. So, so there are parts of the communion where therefore social media or things like that may not be an issue, but it's changing. Things are changing a lot. So yes, social media is, uh, we need to use it for the good of uh, the work of God, but at the same time also be careful in how we use it. Uh, and I think it's important that, I don't know whether you have a system of uh, you know, or guidance of how you actually use it in your province. I know that in the Church of England, they have had to come up with guidelines of how to, how to use it. So across the community, yes, it varies from, different, from province to province. One of the things that is an important thing to underscore is that our contexts are different across the communion. And we need to remember that, uh, that let's not judge uh, whatever is happening in other parts of the communion using our own ways of look, looking at things. That brings me to the question on innovation. Again, context is important. Remember to always look at what is relevant in your context. What is, what is, don't close your mind and say, this is how we've always done church and we, this is how we're going to continue doing church. Because if you do that, then you, you may be missing out on some important, you know, members of God's family who you should be able to bring in. So look at ways of how you can you know, be innovative in, in the way you do church, in the way you minister. I, in our table earlier this morning, they asked me as to what my thoughts are, even as we were looking at the question. So one of the things I see now living here in this country is that we, you seem to all the time uh, obey what is known as the 11th commandment, mind your own business. <laughs> because you don't want to touch, you don't want to step on people's toes. But where I come from, you can confront a person, you know, by asking them a, a direct question uh, or even make, you know, a call at the end of your sermon and say to them, this person that I have spoken, I want you to implement it in your life or even in some cases make an altar call. And going back to the diocese last year, at the end of a service after I preached, I actually forgot to make a specific call to the, to the people. Someone came to me and said, Bishop, you forgot to make an altar call. I want to commit my life to Christ. And I felt guilty, you know, living here for five, six years. 
I was doing things the way we do it here. At the end, I now had to make an appeal and say, are there others who want to make, make who would like us to pray for? And three or so people came back, came forward. So, so again, that is, that is being, being innovative. Um, what are some of the poorest parts of the communion? A number of provinces struggle. Um, I remember talking to a primate and telling him, you have not paid your provincial contributions. And he told me, Bishop, I want to pay my contributions, but at the moment the roof of my provincial office is leaking. I want to sort it out before I pay my contribution. And I thought, oh, actually, if you have your, the roof of your provincial office leaking, you sort that out before you pay a contribution that are going to London. <laughs> and, and, and that is an example of a province that is struggling. And, 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 and again, I was, I was visiting a province recently. I was surprised that the bishops, the new bishops there were to be given a car immediately after they were consecrated. Where I came from as a diocesan bishop, it took me three years before I was able to raise money for the car that I was using as a bishop because I was from a province that struggled financially. So Burundi is a province that struggles. Kong, some parts of Congo struggle, South Sudan, uh, but, but I think financially some of those provinces struggle, but I think spiritually, yes, they will be rich. Hence the importance of linking up, companion links, so that you exchange you know, ideas, exchange visits, exchange things that you can learn from each other. Uh, I think the other, uh, the other uh, comment was, was uh, uh, you know, a challenge to us, as, as, uh, to you as, 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 as um, governing body. The question from Stephen was regarding the, whether there will be a youth, a pre Lambeth Youth Conference, like the, it was done many years ago. I, I remember the last time this wasn't considered because of cost, issues of cost. But I think it's a good thing to say, and definitely we'll take note of that because we can see the need for that. <coughs> One of the new th changes now is that we now have a youth network. And, and it's important for us to be aware of the various networks that we actually have in the communion and, and be involved. Many of you, I believe, are people who know how to use your computers or the internet. So it may be worth even looking at what is happening in different parts, parts of the communion and the various networks and commissions. Where an area where you can use your gifts. This morning we looked at gifts. You may want to you know, find a way of you know, accessing some of these things. And, and it does not necessarily also need to be dust to dust is link, but even as we heard earlier, you know, the need for twinning parishes and other parishes, of course, with the support of your bishop, we are Anglicans, we always want to make sure we do things the right way. It's important that we actually do that and you can learn from each other. Thank you. Uh, Bishop Anthony, thank you so much. Uh, it's always a pleasure to hear about the work of the Anglican Communion and to be reminded that we are a global family and that we should live in interdependence with one another. Uh, thank you as well for your own ministry as Secretary General and we wish you every blessing on that. It's been a joy to have, with you, have you with us here in Governing Body and uh, some of your supporters, and we wish you well for the future. Might I invite Governing Body to join me in praying for Bishop Anthony before we move to next business? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life of the Anglican Communion, and we ask you to bless it that we may be faithful to Jesus Christ, bold in proclaiming the Gospel, kind to one another, and working always to witness to the ways of the kingdom. Thank you for Bishop Anthony and the important role to which you have called him. Bless him in his work. Grant him wisdom in difficult situations, boldness in the work of reconciliation, and the joy of the gospel, that it may be communicated through his work and ministry 
And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all very much. We now move to item 18b, which is the extra item requested by the Archbishop, and I invite him to speak to us now. Uh, Chair, thank you very much, uh, Andrew Archbishop. Um, I'd like Governing Body's permission to invite Judge Nick Cook to come and make a statement to you following the introduction of a private member's bill in the House of Lords, um, I think in the last 24, 48 uh, hours, relating to imprisonment for public protection. Now, many of you might not know what that is, but it's a particularly difficult, may I say, odious piece of practice within the life of our nation. And as Christians who are committed to working against injustice, there's an opportunity, the first time for a number of years, for us to um, add our voice to the concerns which are now finding shape uh, within that private member's uh, bill being presented to the House of Lords. My request then, Chair, is for uh, permission to be given to Judge Nick to come and speak to us for about five to ten minutes. Could I invite governing body members to show their consent? Thank you very much. And uh, Chancellor Nick Cook, may I invite you now to speak? Thank you very much, Archbishop Diocco Galland. Thank you very much governing body. Um, I'm speaking about something which has occurred within the last 24 to 48 hours. A private member's bill has been presented by Lord Woodley in the House of Lords, which will lead, if it gets through the legislative maze, to the resentencing of about 2,750 people who are presently in custody and others who are out on license and potentially subject to recall, upon whom the sentence of imprisonment for public protection, that's an indefinite sentence with a tariff. You can't get out unless you prove certain things to the satisfaction of the parole board. As a result of the effects of long-term imprisonment on public health, various changes within the parole board and the non-availability of the courses in overcrowded prisons which prisoners need to undertake in order to satisfy the parole board, there is a continuing torturous dilemma of how to make progress for those affected and, of course, their families. Let me also mention that this includes a number of people who were sentenced to detention for public protection. That was the equivalent sentence for those between 12 and 18. I'll repeat the first part, 12. That's the age of criminal responsibility in our jurisdiction. So there are a small number of people who were so sentenced when they were very young indeed by any standards. So let me put this and my appeal to you in the context of this meeting and our faith. When we renew our vows at a baptism, we promise to fight against injustice wherever we encounter it. Do you mean it when you say it? I'm sure you do, but here's a concrete chance to do that by signifying our support for the principle of resentencing. Reminding governing body of something we heard during an important sermon earlier in our meeting, you will remember the tale of Johnny Cash in the cave and the angel visiting Johnny Cash and persuading him to carry on living. Ninety prisoners subject to this sentence have taken their own lives in prison hopeless, in a cell where sadly either the angel didn't come or the angel's words were ineffective. Last year, nine, the year before, 
8. It will not surprise you to realize that when hopes are raised that something might be done for these people because legislation is contemplated and then it's dashed, you get a spike in suicides. So this is a life-saving matter where we can intervene. So this sentence was abolished in, 2010, in 2012, but not retrospectively. So, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. Um, this has to be um, done on the hoof. Abolished in 2010, but not retrospectively. It had been introduced by an act passed in 2003 with effect from 2005. So these aren't people who've offended recently. Many of them have done multiples of the tariff that was originally imposed by the judge. Tariff of four years, some have been in for 12, 15, and so on. Um, the issue is complicated. It requires individual resentencing, as is envisaged in this bill. An all-party select committee of the last parliament asked the government to pass legislation to enable resentencing. The outgoing government rejected it. There is now a chance to put things right through the medium of this private member's bill. Now we know, I'm looking down at Kate, that private member's bills have a limited chance of getting through any legislative system. You need the government to take it on. So we have to persuade those of us who want to deal with this matter that the way forward is for the government to adopt this private member's bill, as sometimes happens, and use government time to push it through. Now, I'm not asking you to agree with the detail of the private member's bill as it now is, because it will need some refinement, in my opinion. What I'm asking for is for you to endorse the principle of resentencing. And returning to a theme of this governing body, I'm asking each and every one of you to become prophets, not mystic Meg. I'm not asking you to wear flowing robes and the males amongst us to grow a long beard. But what I am asking you to do is to do what the Old Testament prophets did, which was to point out to those in power that they must do something which is right. That's what they were very good at, and some of them did it at great risk to themselves. I'm only asking you to do it at no risk to yourselves. As I look around the room, you may not see it, but I see a great deal of power in this room, I suspect there are people who are constituents of every MP in Wales. If you write to them, use social media, just heard how important taking that on board is, contact them and say, I and we, the church in Wales, favour resentencing of all these people and the ending of this nightmare for them and their families, it can have an enormous effect. And that's what I'm asking you to do. I don't mean now because we don't have the time, but I'm very willing over lunch to answer any questions about this issue and afterwards if they're communicated to me about the detail, because it is complex. Some of these people committed very minor offences and the sentencing is wholly disproportionate. There are others at the other end of the scale. That's why, because we don't ignore public safety, individualised consideration is needed. But you can't, in Christian conscience, let this disaster go on any longer. So that's what I'm asking. Um, I apologise we've had to interrupt the business. I couldn't have anticipated this. And it's a chance I don't want to lose. Criminal justice is not devolved in Wales. 
We don't control it. It's controlled by Westminster. There are few all Wales gatherings. We are an all Wales gathering with a vast amount of authority and more influence than we sometimes think. If this message goes out with your approval to the media that are covering this meeting, it may do a great deal more good than we might at first sight expect. Thank you very much for listening to me, and I hope we can carry this forward in some way. I'm just going to look again at the Secretariat and the Archbishop to see if there's any more I could or should do. With governing bodies permission, I think the, the best way of responding to this is if I write as president of the governing body to the government and articulate if you're in agreement, and I'll ask for a show of hands to take this matter forward. Um, of course, you are all entitled to write to your constituency MPs, as Nick has suggested, uh, urging their support for this to become government business as well. I won't write to you unless I do so with your mandate. If you are in favour of me writing, do you want to raise your hands? Are there any who are doubtful and would rather me not? Are there any? Yes, thank you. I'm glad the answer. Sorry, I'll be quite brief. I don't know if I'm being really stupid here, and I probably am. I'm just confused in my head. The, the term Resentencing sounds to me like rubber stamping will keep them in for another 15 years. And I'm assuming that's not what it means. <laughs> if you could just... Could you just give your name and diocese as well before you... Sorry, sorry, sorry. Annabelle Ellison, clergy, Swansea and Brecon. No, it's the opposite of rubber stamping. I won't take up too much time for the same reason, but I'm afraid I've left someone uncertain because of the shortness of the explanation as to what it is. Imprisonment for public protection means you go to prison forever, there's a tariff set. It was triggered by the existence of certain factors, effectively a pre an earlier conviction. It might have been 15 years ago and it might have been for a fairly minor offence, such as assault occasioning actual bodily harm, which is any form of injury at all which has been caused in an assault. So the judge, unless he could find exceptional circumstances, and the Court of Appeals say the word exceptional means exceptional, had to pass a sentence of imprisonment protection with public protection. And at the beginning, tariffs were as low sometimes as four months. So the actual offence itself meant that, but there was a presumption of dangerousness, so you're in. Resentencing, not rubber stamping, Imprisonment for public protection has gone. The detail is under the private member's bill, and this is sensible and I don't quarrel with this part of it, to be worked out by a panel including experts in the appropriate fields and a judicial representative. And the sentencing would be capped at a certain level, reflecting what the sentencing would be now for an offence of that type, IPP not having been available for the last... Um, well, whatever, however many, 14 years, isn't it? So that's what the position is. No element of rubber stamping, subjective, not triggered by some um, set factor, but looking at the particular circumstances of the individual prisoner. Um, that's what's proposed. I think I've made it yeah, sufficiently right. clear. <clears throat> Thank you, Chancellor. I'm not going to open this for more general debate uh, because time is pressing on our formal agenda. Uh, the Archbishop has received your mandate to write on behalf of Governing Body, and we've been encouraged by Chancellor Nick Cook to write ourselves to MPs about this issue. I'm sure we all accept the seriousness. Uh, we like to pride ourselves in the United Kingdom as being subject to the rule of law. This would appear to be a, an abuse mm. of the rule of law, uh, which we can and should protest against. So I'm very grateful to the Archbishop for allowing the uh, issue to be raised and to Chancellor Nick Cook for drawing it to our attention. Uh, we will now move to item 19 on the agenda. Thank you very much.
So, right, okay, okay. Um, uh, a member of governing body has registered their own personal uh, circumstances. I'll ask him to make the secretariat available, uh, uh, inform them of that situation, and that an appropriate record is made. Thank you. Um, so, item 19. It is very important <coughs> that governing body is effective in its life. And you, as members of governing body, uh, it's very important that you are engaged in the life of governing body, that you feel that you're making a difference to the church in Wales and for our witness to the kingdom of God by your deliberations here. Governing body meetings are not cheap. They represent a major five-figure investment on every occasion in the well-being of the Church in Wales. And therefore, we want to use this session now in order to be able to harness your wisdom in the shaping of future governing body meetings. And we'd like you to take some time on your tables to reflect, first of all, on this meeting, what has worked well, what has worked less well, and to consider the question about how governing body can further improve its effectiveness and engagement. And so what we're going to do is have roundtable uh, discussions on your tables, and I hope uh, that there are four questions which we're asking you to consider, which will be able to appear on the screen shortly. Um, there may even be hard copies on the tables, but I'm not uh, so uh, confident of that. Have we got a slide uh, with the four questions, please? I will read them out. Um, and if they're not on the uh, screen, I hope someone on each table will scribble them down quickly. Question number one, what went well at this meeting and why? Question number two, what did not go well at this meeting and why? Question number three, which items from the church or from the world could the governing body be invited to explore at a future meeting in order to improve our engagement with a changing society and the church of the future. And question number four, the governing body must be a place for discernment, a place for decision, and a place for dissemination. Are the proportions of the structure of the agenda well suited for those three goals? Discernment and discussion, decision and dissemination. <coughs> so those are the four questions, and I'm going to allow you 20 minutes now to discuss those four questions on your tables. Uh, we would like to ensure that there's a harvest of the wisdom which is gathered. So we would like, please, uh, for one member of the table to act as a rapporteur and to record the wisdom of the discussion. And to this end, uh, John Richfield is, dis is distributing sheets of paper to aid uh, your recording. And those sheets will be gathered in at the end of your discussions. Uh, we are also going to have some time in which to report on those discussions. I, I made a quick count earlier, and there are 16 tables here at Governing Body, so I do not intend to go round each table asking you to report back. But I do hope 
that you will be ready to volunteer the most significant points uh, that you would like governing body to hear, perhaps one at most from each table. Um, and I'll, I'll open that for any table to contribute as boldness seizes the moment. So 20 minutes now, and I'll just repeat the questions because they've not appeared. What went well and why? What did not go well and why? Which issues would you like governing body to consider in the future? And if governing body is for discernment, decision and dissemination, what are the proportions by which we'd like to see those three issues tackled? And you have 20 minutes starting, and it's on the clock as well, starting <laughs> now. Now, and uh, concluding your discussions now, and deciding whether you would like to uh, have someone to speak from your table. What I'm going to do is I'm going to invite uh, those who wish to report, not more than four or five tables maximum to report, and I'm going to invite you to come out and speak from the microphone so that we can all hear you. Uh, it's just going to be the first five people to come forward, and they'll have three minutes to speak to governing body with the clock running. Um, so uh, we can hear something of the flavor of your discussions, but the main way of reporting back will be via the sheets. Richard, you have a point of order? Oh, you're volunteering, great. Right here, we're ready to go. Uh, you don't have 20 minutes, as the <laughs> clock says. You have, there you are, three minutes, thank you. Uh, Richard Mulcahy, Monmouth Diocese, speaking for uh, a mixed table in this corner. A uh, number of things went, went quite well. Some of the, the, one of the long running things is the respect that people show each other in governing body, which isn't always reflected in, in some other synodical governments, should we say, and that we had a particularly well-prepared worship and plenty of opportunities, and I think, from my point of view, I'm getting a lot of feedback, um, from my point of view, I find the discussions at tables, at coffee and over dinner almost more important than what happens formally here, but that's a personal viewpoint. Um, what went, didn't go so well uh, issues with, with food and drink, particularly issues with accessibility across the campus and into and out of accommodation. Um, and again, a personal one. I arrived after finishing work at about eight o'clock. I'm afraid there was no welcome desk. I had to go back and find the, the porter. And luckily the porter knew where, it, where the room was, but he couldn't explain it to me. And I spent half an hour wandering the campus with no idea where I was going. Uh, that may be a metaphor, but still it wasn't the best way of ending a Tuesday. Um, a lot of people would like to have some, like the, what we just had, the discussion, clearly that just came out of the blue almost, that someone presented the bill in the House of Lords, but similar issues, that if they could come to us uh, in a timely fashion so that we can react rather than saying, oh, well, we'll let a committee look at it and come back. They felt that that was useful. There are some issues about people like me who can't take a formal role on on anything which affects government policy, but those can be worked around. Social justice was the most important phrase that came out of it, so that was Kate's. Um, discussion, dissemination, and so on, was something we, we, we had some trouble with because someone also mentioned discernment. We weren't sure if that went into discussion or decision, uh, and then we ran out of D words. But uh, I don't, we felt that perhaps this wasn't the best place for dissemination. If this is a case of you're giving us some information which we then take back to the diocese and parishes. No, there are better networks for doing that, electronic and otherwise. You know, you can't expect us to come back uh, and say, right, well, we remember this from governing body and then share it out on a sort of cascade basis. But things like um, the 
Obviously, I have to say this, he's still in the room, but what we heard from Bishop Anthony, some of the other points that we've had are useful for us to know and to share with people. Something more strategic rather than, than on that. Um, and my final comment was about hearing more about growth. We've heard about the growth fund, but there's, there's been less on, on actual growth. And even if it's just to encourage us to go out and see what, what's been happening elsewhere and, and is happening here. And I would really like to just run this down so that we have just maybe one second left and I can say Diolch With one <laughs> second left to go indeed. Um, I see we have four other speakers. I intend to close the list after that uh, because I think we'll be ready to move on. But we will take each of the four. Caroline, you're up next. Thank you. Caroline Wallard, elected Monmouth. I'm just going to pick Richard up on one thing. I think dissemination of what we do here at Governing Body back in our ministry areas and our parishes is really important. Uh, what went well, um, things that haven't been said all right, we thought that the fact that the bishops and the archbishop get around a bit and talk to lots of different people was absolutely great. Love the visiting speakers, absolutely love the Bible study. Um, people have talked about lunch already. Just a technical point needs to have allergens mentioned, put on the, in front of all the different sandwiches. I think that's a legal requirement. Uh, more issues that we could look at. Um, how about this one? The international supply of weapons. We have BAA systems in Monmouthshire. Uh, and we thought that the agenda worked very well this year, that there was uh, a good spread of different things at different times. Um, and I'm not going to take up all of my time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Melody. Uh, Melody Lewis elected Lay St Asif and I'm speaking on behalf of a mostly St Asif table and a, quite a young table as well so we thought it was important that we came up and shared our opinions. Um, largely agree with what has already been said um, but we did think that it was potentially useful to maybe have a youth element to governing body um, because we did say that a lot of us don't often feel that we can Although we know we can, we have the right to, it's kind of scary to come and talk when you're in a room full of real adults. Um, <laughs> and so we thought if there was potentially a time within the procedural matters of governing body where we are allowed to talk about things that are important to us, particularly social justice and that sort of thing, it would mean that our voices did get heard in a way that we wanted them to rather than having to sort of think on the spot and try and come up with something just so that our voices get heard because sometimes that can feel somewhat artificial um, if you're saying things just to have a youth voice heard if we could actually have time to plan and give a presentation on youth voices in the province we thought that would be very useful um, but everything else that's been said I won't repeat because we agreed largely <laughs> thank you thank you very much indeed Dean Nigel Nigel Williams ex officio um, most of what we've discussed has already been said. Um, in terms of topics for future consideration, um, we've got the CRT model at work in the province. We've got Citizen Church, we've got Hope Street. Um, the question we have, who can come to talk to us and show us the way about evangelism and growth in areas of social deprivation? And Archdeacon Matthew. Thank you. Matthew Hill, St. David's Diocese, cleric, elected. So lots of commonality with what's already been said, but to, to reinforce them, some things. The ability to network and discuss and relate and learn informally outside of the sessions, because, of course, whilst there are costs to meeting together, uh, there would be costs to not being able to do that together as well. Um, the flexibility and responsiveness to questions, uh, within the proceedings uh, has gone well. Um, that's fostered uh, trust. Actually being able to be physically together in a chapel on site has also gone uh, uh, very well. Um, we, we acknowledge complaints about uh, accommodation, food and so forth, but want those to be balanced against the costs uh, involved and value for money. Um, and then not enough uh, 
group discussion, really, uh, and we could perhaps make some use of technological aids um, to, to facilitate that. More reporting and discussion uh, of the Church Growth Fund, um, and we wanted some reporting or seek topics from provincial officers and internal um, provincial organisations as well, and to highlight um, relevant current policy issues in Wales, such as um, the Global Futures Generations Act and things like that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much, all of you, for participating in that discussion. Uh, we had just about the right amount of reporting back, I think, uh, so grateful for that as well. Do please make sure that a sheet recording each table's discussion is handed in to Mr. Richfield. We all know and love him, and so there's no excuse for not taking your sheet immediately at the end of this session to his desk so that he can give a long 16-page report to the chief executive. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I now return the chair to the Archbishop. Uh, thank you, Bishop Gregory. The idea that you could escape without John Richfield not being you and making sure you handed over is an intriguing prospect. I don't see that um, happening. We're, we're almost at the end of our um, meeting, um, but there is one uh, very small item I did yeah. mention earlier on, which was yesterday you requested the Secretariat go back and look for an alternative date for April 2028 for our our meeting as a governing body. They have now done that. Would you like them to share that date and vote on it? You would, in which case, Simon. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Archbishop. Simon Lloyd, Lay Secretary. You'll see the dates are on the screen in front of you. All we have done is propose dates the week after Easter week. So the dates you had in your pack, this is one week later. In which case, if you would like to be the meeting of April 2028, as Simon has just outlined, would you please raise your hands to support? Are there any against? Are there any abstentions? That's passed unanimously. Thank you very much. <coughs> Um, so we close with just a few announcements. Please do bear with me. Um, there are a few, but they are really very important. I want to begin with thanks, first of all, to thank the staff who've helped to make the meeting run so smoothly. We really appreciate, under some quite difficult circumstances, all you've done to make the governing body work. We really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Um, we're grateful, of course, to um, Bishop Anthony Pogo, who's been with us. It's been a delight to have you here. Anthony, thank you for being with us. Um, those members who've undertaken particular tasks, such as chairs and arranging our worship, particularly uh, my chaplain, Reverend James Tout, the worship coordinator, uh, Archdeacon Paul McNess for his Bible study and prayers, the Reverend James Henley and Canon Hannah Rowan for their contribution to our worship. Thank you all very much. Highlights will be available on the website within about two weeks of this online meeting, a valuable aid for members reporting back, as Caroline indicated, to their own diocese and ministry areas. It's my great pleasure um, at the conclusion of her tenure as National President of the Mothers' Union to thank Mrs Jenny Lane for her work to the Mothers' Union and to us as a province, and to announce that our own uh, Sue Rivers has been appointed as her successor, and we ought to congratulate Sue, who from January will be the new president. Um, just to announce that the card machines are now working, if you would like to give, I know you will, uh, they are in the information desk as you leave on your uh, left to complete the uh, collection. Um, before I announce the date and place of the next meeting, there is one very particular farewell that I would like uh, to make. Um, and I need to speak in English because um, his 
translating would defeat the object. <laughs> and that is, of course, Mr. Tudor Jones, our simultaneous translator. I wonder if Tudor could be brought forward. That made it sound like an execution was about to take place. <laughs> say um, thank you, uh, Tudor, for your 20 years of service to the Church in Wales. You've been a very familiar face at governing body meetings and a great number of other meetings such as our electoral college as well. You really do know us extremely well. You could write a book, but we don't want you to do that. <laughs> you have far better things to do, I'm sure, with your retirement. Uh, although Tudor is a professional translator. His presence here has been so <clears throat> constant. He's been willing to help with impromptu translations to help keep the screens bilingual. Translating set pieces, such as my um, address and the off-cuff speeches of so many members who've addressed the GB in the Welsh language. We regard Tudor very much as one of us. His presence has been entirely welcome, and we're so grateful for all that he's given. Uh, Tudor has told us next year he wishes to retire and spend more time with his family at last. We've enjoyed your presence. We've enjoyed your work so very, very much. I'm going to say a quick word now in Welsh because you don't have to translate. Tudor Valchiaun and Bob Dim, Hiwedi Roy in Evel, Egluswer, Aka, Akothgursma, Ma Pitha, Ama and Dod, Gazan Kariad, and in Dioch, Hevid, Akan Dimino, Pob Grass, Hiama, a devoto. Song Valchiatai. Um, Dwi wedi treulio mwy o flynyddoedd nag y gallai gofio yn cyfieithu be mae bobl eraill wedi ddweud. Um, I've spent more time than I can remember translating what other people have said. I'm now going to have to say something uh, myself. Um, I'm going to keep it brief because I might get emotional otherwise. So I'm getting old and I'm getting more emotional as I, as I age. Um, I was told this morning that I, I was regarded, and in fact the Archbishop has just said something similar, um, that I, that I feel one of you. Um, technically, that isn't, the tri that isn't the case. But I must say, of all the people, of all the organizations that I've worked with over the years, and there have been many <laughs> at my age, I must say that you are the organization that's made me feel most at home. And that means a great deal to me. And between the Ochi Baupo, or we Lord Callan, and we end the Chrim, and I must know I'm really here. I never used to be emotional. I've spent 60 plus years of my life without showing almost any emotion at all, but I've showed quite a lot. <laughs> but in the last eight, I've showed quite a lot, I'm afraid, for all kinds of reasons. So, um, diolch chi o wylod calon am y croeso, bydda i'n y colli chi um, o ddifri, um, ond uh, bydda i'n trysori'r asgofion a allai ddim ond yn ynddo i chi. I'll treasure the memories and I wish you well. Diolch mawr iawn. The governing body has decided that uh, the next ordinary meeting will be held on Wednesday the uh, 30th of April and Thursday the 1st of May 2025 at venue Cymru in uh, Llandidno. That completes all of our business. Shall we stand for prayer and God's blessing? And so to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and across the ages, our Lord Jesus Christ. A bendith diw hotlalliog, a tad a mabar ysbryd glan, a fo yn eich plith, a cadrigo gydach wi nawr ac am Amen. The Lord be with you. 
safe journey home, everyone.